In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his goodness and his mercy to the human family. That whenever any member of the family strays from his straight path and loses his divine favor, before he punishes, he always raises from among that people a prophet or a messenger and he gives that prophet that which is called divine revelation. And by means of that divine revelation, he calls the people back to the path of righteousness that he might once again bestow on them the blessing of his favor. We thank Allah for all of his prophets, all of his messengers, all of his sages and wise men that have come to the people of our planet. Most of all, we thank him for Musa or Moses and the Torah. We thank him for Jesus and the Gospel. We thank him for Muhammad and the Quran Peace be upon these worthy servants of Allah. I am a student of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and I could never thank Allah enough for intervening in our affairs to bring us back to his straight path in the person of Master Farad Muhammad who came among us and raised from among us one to lead, to teach, to guide us as his messenger to us, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters with the greeting words of peace we say it in the arabic language assalam alaikum my dear brothers and sisters uh, this has been a very emotional moment for me to hear music in the mosque for the first time in 20 years. I thank Allah so much that sound that we heard from the shofar, the ram horn that announces Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur and Shabbat or the Sabbath calling the people of Israel to purification and preparation for atonement for sin and wrongdoing that we may keep Allah's favor to us. We thank those who come by the sound of the bell to Christian worship and a black man from Ethiopia named Bilal who created from the Spirit of God that which is called the Adan or the call to prayer. These three branches of pure monotheistic belief that spring from a father, Ibrahim or Abraham, who was 
a man that fought against polytheism. There is a story in the Quran about the idol worshippers of his day. And there were three of them, one of them larger than the others. And it is written that Abraham in the night knocked down one of the idols. And the next morning the people asked, who did this? And Abraham said, ask the big one. He should be able <laughs> to tell you. And of course, they were upset with Abraham and they boiled him in oil. So we have to be careful <laughs> how you take down the idols that people worship. But it is misplaced worship that has the human family at odds with each other. While the prophet was among us, there was unity among the Jews. When Moses was among them, unity. But when the prophet was gone, division came. The Holy Quran says, they did not become divided till after knowledge came to them, splitting up their religion into sects and parties, vying with one another due to envy. This happened during the time of Jesus. It happened again during the time of Muhammad, peace be upon them. And it happens every time there is a charismatic person who guides people sometimes to a new truth. But when that person dies, then that terrible human condition arises when people seek power, greedy for power, and out of envy they war with one another over who will sit where or who will go there, and then the people of God become divided. Allah says in the Quran, He sent messengers and prophets to every nation. He didn't send messengers and prophets to every nation to preach a different religion. Otherwise, we could charge him with being the author of confusion. While the scripture says God is not the God of confusion, but the God of peace. How did we become so confused? When a messenger or prophet of God came in different parts of the world, they always brought a truth that was to correct the problems of that particular time. But those contemporary truths were founded on immutable principles that never change. So the prophets all over the earth taught the same basic truth. But when the prophet died, people began to name the message after the prophet. 
So, now we have Confucianism, Taoism, Shintoism, Zoroastrianism, right? Some would call Islam Mohammedanism, then Christianity, Judaism. But what is the real message or religion of him who created the heavens and the earth and gave every creature the true religion and what is that when you see the creatures each creature follows a path that is indicative of the nature of that creature all of God's creatures he gives to each a way what is the way that he gave to the human being? Did he change? Did he wait until 2,000 years ago to give man the way? Did he wait until 1,400 years ago to give man the way? No. From the time he created man, he gave him the right way. Allah says in the Quran, set your face for religion, being upright, the nature made by Allah in which he has created man. Look at our planet. Look at how we have become so divided, so hateful, yet claiming the same creator. Do you think that Almighty God is happy with Christians and Muslims and Jews claiming Abraham the upright one, yet destroying each other every day because we think we have the right way? Is that really the right way? Allah created Adam, all the scriptures of Torah, Injil, Quran, talk about Adam. Did God give him the way? You call it religion, we don't even mention such a thing. That's man's invention. What is your religion? What is your religion? What is your religion? No, what is the nature in which God created you? That is the way. That is the right way, but most men know not. When God created Adam, he gave him the right way. What was that? He said, Adam, eat of all the tree, fruit of the trees in this garden. But this one in the middle of the garden, this tree you should not eat. It seems like when God or parents tell us what we shouldn't do, seems like all of a sudden we get a drive. I wonder, I wonder why mama told me not to do that. 
I wonder why God told us not to do that. I think that's the very thing I want to do. There is something in human nature that makes us desire to do what pleases us against the wise counsel and guidance of God. The real religion of God is this. Obey my commands. That's the right way. What do you want of me? Guide me. Now we just got here, some of us. And some of us are ready to leave. But we are so wonderful in the way we treat our automobiles. I just bought a new Lexus and or a new Ford or a new Cadillac or Mercedes Benz or BMW. And in the glove compartment, there's a little manual. Now, if you want to sustain the life of this car, you change the oil at this time, you grease it at this time, you do this at this time. And some of us are very dutiful. We love our cars. Do we think that we know better of how to live a life that we did not give to ourselves? Don't we or shouldn't we think that he who gave us life is the best qualified one to instruct us on how to live the life that he gave? How did we become so wise after just being here a few days? But the one who has no birth record, who is older than the sun, moon, and stars, who knows the nature of you and me and knows what will protect us and what will destroy us. But the thing that God has done out of his love for and respect for the human being. Think about this. He says from the Bible, I created man after my likeness and in my image. That's big. Very, very big. So if God created you and me after his likeness, well, no wonder Jesus told his disciples Listen to these words. When they said to him, Master, when were you hungry and I fed you not? When were you naked and I clothed you not? When were you out of doors and I gave you not shelter? When were you sick and imprisoned and I ministered not unto you? And Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have not done these things to the least of these, my brethren, you have not done it also unto me. We love to make over big shots. Do you know who I met yesterday? Do you know who was in the restaurant when we went to have dinner? I saw so-and-so. 
big shot. When you left your house, you left a big shot. When you left your mom and your dad, when you walked the street, and you saw a homeless person on the corner asking for some help, you may not have known it, but he's a big shot too. He doesn't know it when you walk by the prostitute who doesn't really know who she is, how valuable she is. You walk by a big shot that is in need of service. But we have been trained to look out for those that don't really need us. and to walk by the people most in need. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, one day was talking to a well-placed man. And he was engrossed in conversation with this man and a blind man was tapping his way up to the prophet. And the prophet looked on him because he disturbed the conversation and the prophet frowned. But the Quran says, Allah frowned. And he said to the prophet, you are talking to a man who really in words is wasting your time. And the man that is most in need of your service from him you turn away. May I humbly say religion as it is being preached and practiced is a failure? Not some of them Well, wait, wait, don't be displeased with me. We must judge failure and success by how effective we are in transforming human life. Not how happy the people are over our preaching or the song that we sung or the prayer that we said, and then they go back out in that world to be the same as they were before they came to that house of worship. So when Jesus came on the scene, there were many preaching the law. Many. But Jesus said, Oh, ye hypocrites. Boy, that's a tough word. Who wants to be called such an ugly name? But he said, you have whited sepulchers, and in them are the bones of dead men. The churches and the mosques and the synagogue, they're white, meaning they look pure on the outside, but the people on the inside are like the bones of dead men, dead women. What does that mean? Every religion has what is called rituals. Every religion has a way of devotion that may be peculiar to that faith tradition. 
in the prayer that Abraham made and Ishmael when they reconstructed, uh, laid the foundation of al kaaba the holy house at Mecca, when they prayed, they asked Allah, show us our way of devotion. So there was a way of devotion peculiar to them. In every part of the world, the way of devotion that God gave those people is sometimes concretized in rituals. The ritual itself is not the truth. The ritual is the embodiment of the truth. But when you become ritualistic, I wonder, do you understand? I'm sure you do. See, in Islam, we have been commanded by Allah to perform five daily prayers. And we were taught through the example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the way to pray. So from the outward appearance, if we all follow the way of the prophet, it looks like we're following him. But there's a difference between looks like and what really is in worship. Now, I can raise my hands like this and say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, God is great. But if God is really great in my life, my life will reflect obedience to what he has commanded. But if I say ritualistically, God is great, but I am too. So you told me to do this, but I really want to do that. So God is only great in the words we say, but not necessarily in the life we live. We can bow down, you know, in our prayer service, which is so beautiful we bow at a certain point in the prayer and then at a certain point in the prayer we make what is called sajda or we prostrate we redo the fetal position and in that position we are at our lowest and we our words of god are glory to allah the most high when we submit totally to God, we are always humble. This is a very powerful word, humble. Humility before honor, humble to God. When you bow down to God, then you give him a chance to exalt you. So the Bible says, can anyone add one cubit to their height? We put on stilettos. Not we, some. And when you have on your stiletto, it kind of makes you feel taller. But at the night time after a hard day in the stiletto you are so glad to get those things off your feet to come back to reality i cannot add anything to who and what i am neither can you titles don't add to you 
titles can sometimes take away from you by making us think we are what the title says. So we run for titles, but we don't run for qualification. Now I'm sneaking up on something. Rituals of religion. Prayer is ritualistic. We should perform it. But the Quran says Allah loves those who are mindful of their prayers when they pray. See, sometimes you pray, it's just, for, you know, formality. But guess what? The Quran says <laughs> that when Allah makes something real tough for you and me, then it says you make your prayer sincere. You can pray, but you don't pray as, as really, you know, right in it until you're in deep trouble and boy when we get in deep trouble that's when our prayer is really sincere and then look at the words that come out of our mouths Lord if you get me through this this one time I promise you I will serve you for the rest of my days. So even in those words, it is indelibly put in your nature to serve your creator. I'm getting to something. What will happen when we don't need rituals anymore? See, when the truth of a ritual is made known, the ritual loses significance. We as Muslims, we must once in our lifetime make a pilgrimage to the holy city of Mecca. Some of us have been very blessed to make that journey but when we make that journey, we all should know that everything that we do is a sign of something bigger. When we walk around al kaaba seven times, when we kiss the black stone, when we run between the hills. Signs, something bigger. When we are in the plain of Arafat and it is hot, 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 and we stay there for most of the day in heat and prayer and thoughts about the oneness of God. And then we journey to Muzdalifa and we stone Shaitan. I was there, I picked up stones and boy was I throwing them. I mean, I shouted Allahu Akbar so loud, people had to stop throwing and look at me. <laughs> but throwing stones at a stone that represents shaitan or the devil or satan is not the same as actually hurling truth at falsehood or fighting against the demons that are within ourselves see so when muslims say jihad jihad 
jihad it's a great sounding word but it terrifies others you mean you're gonna kill us who are not Muslims no it doesn't mean that at all jihad only signifies the greatest of all struggles and that is the struggle of the human being against the wickedness of self now I will say what this new beginning is for the nation of Islam I know you are concerned and you're curious well I'm gonna give you a picture and then I will explain in the Quran it says I created you from a tiny life germ and then you became a clot and then you became an embryo and then you became a fetus and then I brought you forth from your mother's womb complete yet incomplete now all along that journey we as human beings are evolving going to stage after stage on our journey to become complete human beings now when you mature to be a grown up man or woman are you yet complete or do you yet have a distance to go to complete your real journey which is the journey of life itself what is that journey the Quran keeps telling us about those who deny the meeting with God you know our journey is from a tiny life germ to become one with our Creator this is why the man Jesus in the Bible is so great a human because in his journey though he lived a short time he accomplished something that some of us can live a hundred years and never accomplish he accomplished oneness with God so when the disciples and he were together they said when will we see the father and he said have I been among you all this long and you have not seen him he said when you see me you see the father for I am in the father and the father is in me me and my father are one it is the same with Prophet Muhammad he was according to the history the most obedient to the will of God that's how you attain oneness with God now God cannot give you the secret of nature unless you please him to that degree that he can open up the secret of nature for us there are many preachers teachers sheikhs mullahs scholars we read our Bible we read our Quran and we say uh, you know the Lord spoke to me last night and we ask uh, what did he say <laughs> well it doesn't mean he didn't but it does mean 
that if he communicated with you the world has a right to know what did he say then don't say what Moses said no tell us what he said to you last night and if he didn't say something new if he didn't reveal to you something that was not known before then maybe you need to stop saying what you can't prove see the musicians played Bach they played and they will play something of Beethoven but when you play something written by somebody else you may know the notes listen good now you may know the notes and you may play the notes but you can't get out of it what is in it because you're not in tune with him who wrote it so when you want to play the composition of one who wrote something the thing we need to do is what was his state of mind when he wrote this what were the circumstances of his life when this came from him so with God many of us read his books hear his words and we call ourselves interpreters but no one can interpret the word of God properly if our hearts are not in tune with him and his will so something has happened in America we have churches we have mosques we have synagogues but the streets are filled with crime violence the abuse of women and children right outside the church right outside the mosque if our religion is only for the walls and the people within them then we have failed I say this because we have spent money to make a beautiful building but that is not what God is interested in if we don't make beautiful people to come in and out of that building doing the will and the work of God then all of this means nothing now to those who are here from different religions and different races I'd like to say something to you about black people uh, if you don't mind <laughs> you know our people are in a very very bad condition and I don't care how many cars we drive or homes we have or money we have the condition of our people is really an indictment against the leadership now this just just hear me because if we really are in tune with the prophets and their writings the religion should never use lose its power to transform 
in the book of Revelations as well as in the book of Isaiah Isaiah says there will be a new heaven and a new earth and the former things will pass away in the book of Revelations a man is talking a man he says behold I make all things new I'm coming to the new beginning now that's a heck of a statement behold I personal pronoun make not some things all things new then he says there'll be a new heaven and a new earth and the former things will pass away okay well we're lined up then to see big change big 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 change if you notice change is the theme in the race for the presidency change and that theme regardless who says it is resonating with the people because deep down in the hearts of the people they are totally thoroughly dissatisfied with government and they are seeking real change but 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 the change that will feed our hearts is not necessarily a political change. The change that will feed our souls is that which is on the scene or coming on the scene today. It is a universal change. Question. Where do we fit? If he's going to make all things new, does that mean Judaism will be made new? Christianity will be made new? Islam will be made new? We will be made new? What does it mean, all things? That's everything. So God is dissatisfied with everything. Will there be new government? New constitution? Uh-oh. Will there be new people in power? Uh-oh. Will that be you? Will that be me? Will that be him? Will that be her? We don't know. But we know this. Change is absolutely necessary now yes there'll be a new heaven and a new earth the honorable Elijah Muhammad said that's both spiritual and physical real the Sun is dying moon is dying they're planets they have a life span we won't be here don't worry about it so the change in the heavens, you don't have to worry about that one. Your, neither your children, nor your children, children, nor your children, 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 children. That will take place, but we won't be here. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the change that it's talking about is a change in the spiritual rulership and a change in the political rulership. 
Now I want to say this. Paul said, we war not against flesh and blood, but against what? Principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness that's up in where? Can you say it again? Thank you, boy. Now, what ruler wants to be changed? People in power want to hold on to power and they will lie, they will steal, and they will kill to hold on to power. That is why most political leaders walk on red carpets, red for the blood that was shed to put them in power, red for the blood that is shed to keep them in power. When I used to visit Libya, my brother Gaddafi was a revolutionary. And they wanted me to join the Mathaba or that part of the government that deals with revolution. And of course, Farrakhan had a different thought. As I told them, no revolution that is made at the point of a gun is not revolution. That's just a change in leadership, probably from one thief to another. They may start off good, but that kind of power that you have to take from the gun, you will continue to use the gun and then dissatisfaction will continue to grow in the people and they will remove that government. America has a marvelous system. I mean, I guess they say it, uh, they stole an election a few days ago. But this is a, a great system. However, something is wrong. Terribly wrong. The founding fathers of this democracy they were men that believed in God. Well, I mean, they didn't treat us so nice. But they did believe in God. This constitution that they uh, wrote, they really wanted not government to be run so much by religion neither did they want the type of separation of church and state that America is suffering from right now what kind of state is this that these religious people that are here today they invite us to the city council, say the prayer, and get out. <laughs> that sounds kind of awful, but it is true. You can say the prayer at the Senate. We're opening up with prayer, y'all. Say the prayer and get out. I praise the Jewish schools because their schools, they have to remember God 
in their schools. They have to pray in their schools. In the Catholic tradition, it is the same. In the Muslim tradition, it is the same. But the public schools are suffering because God has no place in them. And so all kind of wickedness is seen in the public school system. A question. What are you teaching? Well, I teach biology. Well, who created that that you study? Who created the amoeba? Who created any life form that you're studying to call yourself a biologist? Is it not he whom you dis, uh, don't want to have his name mentioned? He's the real headmaster, you know. You're studying physics, chemistry, history. But the God who is the author of it all, you can't mention his name? Then something is wrong in a system like that. Now let me say this for the record. The founding fathers wanted separation of church and state, but not disconnect of the church from the state or the state from the church. Do you realize that all throughout these books, Bible, Quran, God respected kings, but he sent to kings prophets. And the prophets always said to the king thus saith the Lord today however the prophets are bought by the kings and therefore if you're looking for a favor from the kings you don't want to talk too much so you kind of muscle your mouth a little bit so you can get a favor from the ruler but then you're not seeking the favor of God. You're seeking the favor of man. So you lose the favor of God. Now what happens? What happens if there's a disconnect between heaven and earth? If the sun does not draw water up from the earth's surface, into the earth's rotation which is called gravitation forming what is called a cloud and if the wind does not drive that cloud over an earth that is dead and rain down on that earth so that the seeds in the earth may swell germinate and come up that we may eat and feed from the earth because there's a connection between what is above and what is beneath. We don't have that connection anymore. And that's why the human being is suffering and is a caricature of what God intended human beings to be. We are no longer man in the image of God. We are a caricature of what God intended because we are all filled with rebellion. And whatever Allah God said thou shalt not do, government says it's okay. It's all right. Help yourself. So the confusion is so great. But you, my brothers and sisters, when Elijah Muhammad came among us, he taught what you could call a black theology. A lot of people were offended by that, turned off by that. 
in the Muslim world they were angry they said you know Islam does not teach color what's wrong with you people but they don't know what happened to us I'm going to read something to you that was written by one who was in the, the um, Virginia House of Delegates. That man said that we have extinguished, listen, every avenue by which light can enter the slave's mind. And he said, if they continued along that line, we would, black people, would be in a condition that we could never come out of. Now let's, let's look, I want you to look at black people now. And I'm going to ask you a question. My Arab brothers and sisters who are here, you give honor to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, because he took the Arab from a state of what they call jahiliya or extreme ignorance. And with this book, Quran, he raised the Arabs and made the Arabs a power in the world through divine revelation. The Caucasians once lived in the hills and cave sides of Europe. They didn't know how to cook their food or bury their dead. But Moses taught them. And from a cave state, they came forth. And now, you can say, by the light of the silvery moon, and white folks say, I'm going there. Think about that. You can say, I wonder, is there something going on on Mars? They put together the mathematics, the science, and they got a contraption on Mars. See, they, they don't believe in a mystery God. They believe in the reality of God and how God works through the human by giving us insight into the nature of his creation. Here's a people that have been in America over 450 years. And foreigners come to America. And within a few days, they have money, they have businesses, they have economic standing. They're proud of being an American. because they came here with nothing and they have what they have. We've been here longer than anyone else except the native indigenous people, Indians. But we, we have some stars among us. We do. We have great minds among us. We do. We have people that are shaking the world. We do. But the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, you can never, no one man can ever escape being identified with the condition of his people. If your people are nothing, how can you be something? If you don't change nothing into something, then you just something that is made. So,
if you look at the condition of black people they had a um, something on TV on CNN and it, it was about black people and it started off with deadbeat fathers and women who were pregnant from a man but there's no man to help them to support them that's the way it started and it ended after days now of the AIDS pandemic that is in our community more than any other community and that the black woman today according to that is the greatest uh, carrier of the AIDS virus they went to education they not only showed how whites in America are being dumbed down but the most intelligent in America in science and mathematics are those from Asia India Korea China Japan where are white people they down on the list where are Hispanics down on the list where are black people now if this is our condition and if you go in the Caribbean you see that the businessmen are Chinese they're Arabs they're white they own the businesses black folk may be in office but they're not the owners of the wealth this is in the Caribbean this is in Africa black people want to do something for self but there's something missing talk to me well wait a minute if something is missing my question to you is don't we need somebody to address us and our concerns to raise us reform us transform us and make us again what God created us to be the man that came to us from Mecca we call him master Farad Muhammad he had a black father and a white mother that man came to us first because our condition was worse he was so skillful he developed a methodology along with an ideology that would start a process of transformation in our lives I want you to please listen to me there never was a people that are considered in scriptural terms as mentally dead the Arabs were ignorant but they weren't dead they were in their own land speaking their own language they weren't dead they were ignorant all the people that had a prophet they were in their land God raised a messenger from among them that spoke their language and dealt with their problems the messenger doesn't have to be universal 
if he's called to deal with a specific sickness in a specific people our people are sick unto death and we need somebody let's listen Master Farad Muhammad with a white mother and a black father he was able to come in and out of America for 20 years before he even made himself known to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad he was among white people he was in the colleges he was here he was there he was studying studying your mind the mind of the slave the mind of the slave master because he had to deal with both minds both cultures now this may shock some of you but he wanted to help eventually both people message that you call black supremacy that fed a broken heart a broken mind a broken spirit as a Caucasian person sometimes you look at us you may not understand what we've been through that puts us in the condition that we are in so you don't know how to deal with us you you don't know how to deal with us the teachers that teach us in school they throw up their hands now some of us can function in white society very well we're acculturated we're educated we're stimulated <laughs> by the wealth of America and we want it for ourselves so whatever we have to do we adapt but the masses they can't adapt they don't know what this is here no jobs the greed of the corporate giants to move factories out of the inner cities into the suburbs and then in foreign countries to get cheap labor that knocks out the white uh, labor and black labor today the whole move of enticing our brothers and sisters from Mexico and Central America to come here is because they have nothing there so this is an enticement and then corporate America says our bottom line is thinning out we must increase our bottom line let's get cheap labor from Mexico from Central America South America our brothers and sisters from Mexico are not trying to take your job they're just trying to survive and by coming here America already knew that they were undocumented and they didn't care we want a bottom line and the Mexican brother and sister works very hard now some of our brothers and sisters from Mexico and Latin America worked on this building we didn't have to find them they were there they worked hard but some of us we work a few minutes, we talk a few hours, 
And then, oh yeah, by the way, I had a job to do. But at the end of the week, we want the money. See, there's something ugly about that picture. But it is real. And we cannot escape the reality of our condition and want other people to see us as an equal when we cannot qualify for equality. No, listen, listen, listen. But listen to this scripture. God said he would choose a foolish people to be his people. He will choose the things that are not to bring to naught the things which are. And he said, thou shalt no more be the tail thou shalt be the head. Then the scripture says, this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our sight. As we conclude, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, he heard the footsteps of Bilal an Ethiopian black man going into paradise ahead of his own. How could a follower of a great one precede him into paradise? It doesn't mean that Bilal is going to enter heaven before the prophet. It means, I believe this, that whenever you say you are chosen, please don't use such language, <laughs> unless you're going to do what you're chosen to do. Listen, whenever God raises a people from ignominy to greatness. It is because he wants to use that people for a broader, bigger purpose. The Arabs were chosen by Allah to be the recipient of a prophet considered the greatest though we don't make distinctions among the prophets because whoever is greater or lesser that's by Allah's command there are some prophets that he gives greater wisdom to than others but that's not to make one feel I'm better it's just that Allah sometimes gives greater knowledge to a prophet for the mission that that man has to accomplish if you have a simple task, you get simple knowledge. If you've got a big task, we give you big wisdom. Now wait, 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 I'm almost finished. Brothers and sisters, the Arabs were given this Quran and they were told to spread it to the ends of the earth. I have to say that for the most part they did their job. The Arabs kept the book Quran pure. That's wonderful. You get great credit for that. But we failed because we arrogated to ourselves that which made us think that this was the Arab religion. And I've seen some of my brothers when they hear I'm a Muslim, they say, oh, we're very happy that you accepted our religion. Stop. I did not accept your religion. 
I and we accepted the nature in which we are created. We didn't need you. We are born Muslims. We thank you for helping us to be ourselves, but don't make us into you. This is what's wrong with Christianity. You want to make people into yourself and deny who they are. You can't make me into you. You can encourage me to be the best that I can be. So now the covenant is broken with the Arabs. Somebody else will have to lead you now back to paradise. And the prophet himself described him. He said, Bilal, well, that means an African. The prophet said, Bilal would lead into paradise. Really, he's talking about the Arabs. You will go, but it will be somebody different from yourself. that will lead you there it may be a little difficult for you to swallow but I'm going to go all around the room my Christian family see there's a parable in the Bible that talks about your neglect of these pitiful people that were brought to America to be made slaves Christian neglect. The parable is in the Bible. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. I'm going to share something with you. Don't be offended. Please don't. I share it out of love. A man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on the way he fell among thieves who robbed him of his raiment, hit him in the head, and left him wounded in the road. Listen to the scripture. A priest walked by on the other side. He saw the man wounded. He didn't help him. Along came a Levite who came to where he was looked at him but did not help him out of that condition and along came the good Samaritan who saw the man wounded poured oil in his wound bound up his wound took him to an innkeeper gave the innkeeper some money and said, if it is more than what I've given you on my return, I'll pay you. See, it all started over a controversy because Jesus was saying, love your neighbor. And one smart fella said, well, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus didn't answer directly. He gave them a parable. Please don't be offended by what I'm about to say. See, the church walked by on the other side. Look, you all really know how to help us. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the transfer of knowledge. Mm. There would not have to be a black church if blacks who wanted to go to church were treated well in the church then we would not have had to leave the church you were first Baptist we were second Baptist no 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 let's see but look 
if we don't talk like this to one another not with hatred not with vitriol but just to show you look you you failed not us you failed God because when God gives you wisdom and power he gives you an assignment that goes along with that and if you walk by the man that needs your help and you know how to help and you won't give it to that man then how will God feel about you the Levites they saw him they looked at him you know the Levitical priesthood you could help raise black people up from that condition because you were once in it yourself but if we are left in that condition to be exploited then the wrath of God will come down on the church on the synagogue and the mosque some of our brothers own stores and they are forbidden to eat the swine but they will feed it to us some of our brothers are forbidden to take alcohol but they have liquor in their store and they feed it to us some of our brothers know that Allah taught the Prophet to teach us the respect and protection of our women but some see the terrible condition of our women and take advantage of them. This is not good. So what is happening to our country now? Have you noticed the weather? Have you noticed the storms? Have you noticed the fire, the floods, the hail, the wind? See, you don't have power to stop that. America is suffering. Am I right? Yes, sir. Stock market. Your 401k. And you wonder what's happening. God is troubling America because America can do better. I close. All of us as human beings can be better than what we are. We can reflect God or we can be devils. It doesn't matter what color you are. You can be a devil black. You can be a devil white. You can be a priest devil. A shake devil. A cardinal devil? An imam devil? Minister devil? See, we all have the capacity to do right or wrong. This meeting today, this mosque today, is to celebrate the oneness of God and the oneness of humanity the oneness of the prophetic community and the oneness of religion. So I had our research 
16, look at all the religions and bring back to me what is the kernel teaching of every faith tradition. Did you know that in African traditional proverb is, listen, one going to take a pointed stick to pinch a baby bird should first try it on himself to see how it hurts. Now, if you took that and did that to yourself, would you do it to the bird? In the Baha'i faith, the kernel of the teachings of Baha'u'llah is, blessed is he who prefereth his brother before himself. In Buddhism, the kernel of Buddhist teachings is, hurt not others in way, ways that you yourself would find hurtful. In Confucius, or Confucianism as they call it, it is the word shu, which means reciprocity. Do not impose on others what you yourself do not desire. In Hinduism, do not to others which if done to thee would cause thee pain. This is the sum or the total of duty. In Jainism, in happiness and suffering, in joy and grief, we should regard all creatures as we regard our own self. In Shintoism, be charitable to all beings, for love is the representative of God. In Sikhism, the kernel is, don't create enmity with anyone as God is within everyone. In Taoism, regard your neighbor's gain as your gain and your neighbor's loss as your loss. How many of us are happy when we get something and sad when somebody else gets something? See, that's sickness. Look, in Zoroastrianism, whatever you do not approve for yourself, do not approve for anyone else. When you have acted in this manner, you are righteous. Now I save the three Abrahamic traditions for last. Judaism first. In Judaism it says, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. That is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. In Christianity, do unto others as you would have them so do unto you. And in Islam, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. The new beginning of the nation of Islam is that we evolve beyond just the service to our people. I was with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad one day and he said to me, he said, brother, they call me a nationalist. 
He never said he wasn't. He just said, that's what they call me. He said, brother, Islam is not national or black. No, he said, they call me a black nationalist. He said, black is not national. Black is universal. All the time that that man was among us, he was feeding us, teaching us, guiding us, and I'm sure his family members can bear witness there were whites that came to his table, there were Asians that came to his table, there were great imams and scholars that came to his table. He never mistreated anyone. He gave them respect. His last sermon to us in 1974, he had two white Muslims on the rostrum with him. One of them was Brother Ali Baghdadi, and the other one was a Muslim from Turkey. And these are his words. He said, these men are not here to see if you are clothed in a long white dress or a long black dress. They're here to see if you are clothed in the principles of your religion. He said again, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, Allah did not raise us, black people, that he raised in this hemisphere, to be mockers of anyone. He's raising us to be servants of the human family after the dross has been taken from us, our job is. Our mission is to help bring in a government of peace wherein we all can live together in peace. But before we can accomplish that mission, we have to grow out of the mind of black inferiority and whites have to grow out of the mind of white superiority. For Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, there is no superiority of the white over the black or the black over the white. The one that is best among you is he or she who is most careful of his or her duty to Allah. Muhammad and Jesus are the two greatest of those who proselytize the teachings. Jesus and his disciples have spread Christianity all over the world. Muhammad and his disciples have done the same. Are Muhammad and Jesus enemies? No. Why then are we? Is Muhammad and Jesus an enemy of Moses and the Israelite prophets? Then why are we? I think we all need to rise from this house and all houses like it to teach a message that will inspire, motivate, and stimulate human beings to act that God be reflected in us. Elijah Muhammad said the best religion he didn't say Islam he said, the best religion, brother, 
is do unto others as you would have others do unto you and love for your brother what you love for yourself. All the rest of the teaching is based on that principle. When you go forth out of this place today, let us go forth determined to be better tomorrow than we are today. As you drive down the street, don't drive in a way that offends your neighbor. You know how you fight over parking spaces sometimes? Is it necessary? Give it up. Oh, you can have it, brother. I'll find another one. What would it take from us to be kind? What would it rob us of to be a better human being? And if we start where we are, spread it from where we are, then perhaps in our lifetime we'll begin as we are beginning to see change. We see change going on in America, we see change going on in the hearts of young Caucasians, and they are now instructing their parents. So, older people who have the old way, be careful, because Moses had some old folks <laughs> that didn't want to change. And God had given them a land. And in that land were some giants. And God instructed Moses and Aaron, you know, go ahead, take them into the land. And the people said, not us. We're not going up in there. You and your God go get those giants out of that land and then we'll go in. And guess what God said? Fine, I will let you wander in the wilderness until you die out and I will take your children and they will inhabit the promised land. It is the young people today that every branch of faith should be going after because the promise of God is not necessarily in the elders. The promise of God will be found in the young. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. And now the prayer of dedication. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and Minister Ishmael Muhammad will now say the prayer of dedication.
we honor you and we glorify your name for granting us a chance to be ourselves. Oh, uh, we thank you, the eternal, omnipotent God, for allowing one to come to us to help us on the journey back to our nature. We thank you for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad who taught us that the words that Master Farad taught, be yourself and accept your own. We have agreed to accept our nature and to be ourselves. Oh Allah, we thank you for the promise that you made that we would no longer be the tail, but we would be the head by your command. Make us worthy to not only be your servants, but to take the wisdom that you give us and serve fallen humanity. And as Abraham and Ishmael stood at the Kaaba after their work of restoration and asked Allah to make them Muslims, make them submissive to his will, and raise from among them a nation submissive to his will. We stand before you today asking the same. Make us submissive to your will and raise a nation obedient to your statutes, your laws, and your commands. And as your servant, the prophet David, wanted to build a tabernacle for you, it was in his heart, but you gave that job to his son Solomon, and you blessed the house that they built to glorify your name. We know that there is no house that can hold but we beg you to let your spirit be in this house, be among us. Anoint us with your spirit and cover our head with the oil of divine knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And as in the temple of Solomon, there was only oil enough for one day to light the eternal flame. But you made that oil to last for seven days. Seven represents infinity. We ask Allah, not that you light a lamp with oil, but you light our hearts with the oil of your spirit. And let that be a permanent flame that when we leave your house, we go out into the darkness of the world that your people that walk in darkness may see a great light. And O oh Allah, if we sin or fall short of what you have commanded us, and we repent of our wrong, as you have said in your scriptures, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sins and heal their land. Our Lord, punish us not if we forget or make a mistake. Our Lord, do not lay on us a burden which thou didst lay on those before us. Our Lord, impose not on us afflictions which we do not have the strength to bear, and pardon us and grant us protection and have mercy on us.
home alone. We thank you for this day. We thank you for the labor that we have into this house. And now we ask that all those who hear your word from this house and houses like it, let it touch their hearts, that we may be made new creatures in you. Oh God, we beg of you that you protect us in our going out and our coming in, and should enemies come against us, be thou our protector and our defender, and defend all of those who seek to do your will. We ask it all in your holy and righteous name. We know that this house cannot hold you, but we are the real house of God. We desire to let into us through our ears and the word of yours that is spoken to us. Come into us. Dwell in us that we may become the true body of the God, the true body of the Messiah, Matthew, the Christ. We ask it all. The Ode to Joy by Beethoven. to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Please. At this time, we ask the envelope that was in the program, if you would please uh, put your name, uh, first and last name, your contact or mailing information. And at this time, if you have a contribution to make, uh, either in the purchase of the chair that we mentioned, if you can just put that information down so that we can make sure that 
We have your name uh, etched or engraved in the black brass plate. If you do not wish to make a contribution for the chair at this time, any donation, any charity that you wish to offer is acceptable and we'll ask the Ministry of Finance uh, to come forward. They will pass the receptacles. You can put the envelope on the receptacles as the music uh, plays uh, very softly. And then we will have the benediction uh, by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Thank you.
you will find that among Christians, among Jews, among people of all faith traditions, there is a model community rising. And the unity of all of those communities will become the kingdom of God on earth. Thank you for your presence. Thank you all of these wonderful pastors, imams, rabbis, people of all races. Thank you for honoring us today with your presence. May Allah's peace and blessings be with all of you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum.
Thank you.